especially um, our recording this morning from A.H. Amas or Hamid Ali that all, many of you saw yesterday and, and uh, he's certainly my greatest teacher although I've never met him and never seen him live but uh, I've been much informed by his teachings. <clears throat> the subject I'm addressing this morning is um, illness and what creates illness and as a Western trained medical doctor uh, I was programmed really to see illness as a separate category distinct from health and to see it on see it in purely physical terms so if somebody gets cancer somebody gets rheumatoid arthritis multiple sclerosis ALS Crohn's disease chronic fatigue fibromyalgia chronic asthma chronic psoriasis whatever it is that's just a physical event in the body with no relationship to our emotions and furthermore the individual illness in a person is seen as separate from that person's life in a certain environment. So we separate the mind from the body in Western medicine and we separate the individual from the environment. Now, <clears throat> what's wrong with that, quite apart from the fact that it's not valid, it's also not even scientific in today's um, scientific uh, sense in that the research that shows that these separations are invalid has been done and published and it gets deeper and more proliferates more regularly and yet the insights of the science do not penetrate medical practice. The Buddha 2500 years ago said it best as he said many things best. He talked about what he called the interconnected core rising of phenomena and basically he said that nothing exists on its own. He said when you look at a leaf or a raindrop, meditate on the conditions near and distant that contributed to the presence of that leaf or raindrop. Know that the world, you know, and obviously in the leaf or in the raindrop, there's the sky, there's the uh, irrigation from the, from the clouds, there's the sun without the life of which there could be no life, there's the earth, the minerals, the nutrition that goes into making that leaf. So he said when you look at the leaf, you see the whole world. And he says, um, this is because that is, that is not because this is not, this is born because that is born, this dies and because that dies, the birth and death of any phenomenon are connected to the birth and death of all other phenomenon. The one contains the many, the many contains the one. Now, in modern scientific terms, that could be called a biopsychosocial approach. And to, to give it its full name, it really might be called a biopsychospiritual approach. And what does that mean? It means really according to the North American native medicine wheel, human beings have their spiritual, physical, emotional and intellectual uh, dimensions. And by separating these from another, you can't understand what happens to human beings. So let me give you three examples uh, in terms of health of what might be termed the biopsychosocial approach. So we know, for example, from multiple studies that children whose parents are stressed are much more likely to have asthma. So in polluted areas where there is significant irritation of the airways, where asthma is more common, it is the children whose parents are most stressed who are most likely to have asthma. And you say, well, what's the connection between the parent's stress and the child's lung functioning? And the, uh, the connection is actually straightforward and physiologically utterly simple. But it's highly unusual for anybody to go to the doctor with uh, asthma and be asked anything about their childhoods or their relationship with their parents or how they relate to themselves. Now, how do we treat asthma? We treat it with basically two medications combined in an inhaler or separate inhalers or we inject them into people if they're severely asthmatic and one medication is designed to open up the narrowed airways, the other is to suppress the inflammation of the airways. Now, the medication that opens up the airway, the bronchodilator, is actually a copy of adrenaline or it's adrenaline directly. The medication that suppresses the inflammation or which, um, which is either a copy of uh, cortisol or is cortisol directly. In other words, we're giving cortisol and adrenaline to make the child's lung function normally. Now, what are adrenaline and cortisol? Does anybody here know what they are? They're the stress hormones. So they're the hormones manufactured by our adrenal gland adrenal, renal kidney, adrenal top of the kidney, the adrenal gland makes two, and I know I'm speaking fast because I only have 40 minutes and I have a lot to tell you, but I, I hope I'm getting across here. The adrenal gland makes two hormones, one is named after it, adrenaline, 
And the adrenal gland, like the brain, is a cortex. Cortex means bark, like the bark of a tree. So that makes a hormone named after it called cortisol. Adrenaline, if you're threatened and stressed, will increase your heart rate, send more oxygen to your brain and your muscles, make your muscles stronger so you can fight and escape. Cortisol will elevate your blood sugar so you have more energy for the fight or flight response. That's the stress response. In the short term, that's what they do. What's the connection? The connection is that when parents are stressed, kids are stressed. Because the emotional stresses of the parents invariably and inevitably affect the child. And there's a quote from Almas that illustrates that very beautifully. And he says, the infant, the child is very open and can feel the pain and suffering going on in its immediate environment. The child is aware of its own body and can also feel the tension and rigidity and pain in the body of the mother or of anyone else he's with. If the mother is suffering, the baby suffers too. The pain never gets discharged. The organism does not develop the confidence that it can regulate itself, that things will happen the way they should. So, when parents are chronically stressed, so are children, especially very sensitive children, and that means that their adrenal gland is working overtime. They're releasing cortisol and adrenaline higher than normal or healthy quantities. Their adrenal system gets exhausted, and now we have to give them extra stress hormones to keep their lungs open and uninflamed. Biopsychosocial, the psychological and social relationships with the parents program the biology of the child. And of course, if you ask why are the parents stressed, well, that's a social thing. Parents are stressed because of economic insecurity, because of war, racism, or because of issues unresolved from their own childhoods. But any number of things can stress the parents, which then have an effect on the child. Now, another example of what may be called a biopsychosocial perspective, in other words, illustrating the utter impossibility, invalidity of separating mind from body and the individual from the environment. Women with breast lumps, 500 in a study in Australia, they were biopsied because they had a lump that was suspicious for malignancy. Before the results came back, the women underwent a psychological interview. When the results were collated, it turns out that if a woman was emotionally isolated, that by itself did not increase the chance of the lump being cancerous. Similarly, if a woman was stressed, that has zero effect on whether the lump was cancerous or not. But if a woman was emotionally isolated and stressed, the risk of that lump being cancerous was nine times as great as the average. Now, the researchers, being Western-trained scientists and medical doctors, couldn't figure this one out. Because they said, how does zero and zero add up to nine? But if you understand the biopsychosocial nature of human beings, it's straight obvious. Because here's the thing. If you're stressed, <coughs> experience some upset or, th or threat, your, your adrenaline and cortisol levels are going to be high in order to help you deal with the stress. In the short term, that's positive. But let me read you a quote from a, an article published in the journal Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the American Pediatric Association. This journal was, uh, this article was published, it's from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And this article was published two years ago. And if only the medical profession understood the implications of this article in a major medical journal, medical practice would be totally different. And here's what they say. Growing, growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress, or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come at a significant cost to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, the adaptations that a child makes to endure stress in the short term, help him survive, and in the long term, make him sick. Now, if you look at how that works in terms of the stress hormones, they've had their value in the acute threat situation, flight or fight. In the long term, what does the development do? <clears throat> it elevates the blood pressure, it narrows your blood vessels, it increases the risk, it makes you nervous, anxious, and it increases the risk of heart disease and strokes. Short-term adaptation, long-term illness. Cortisol in the short term, 
gives you more sugar so you can fight back or escape in the long term. It thins your bones so you get osteoporosis, makes you depressed, put fats on your belly so that your risk of heart disease goes up, ulcerates your intestines, and suppresses your immune system. Now let's go back to that Australian study. Let's say you have a woman who's stressed. Something happened. Somebody hurt her or she lost a job or something occurred. But she's not emotionally isolated. So she's sitting there upset and stressed and her hormone levels are high. But somebody, a friend, a, a trusted companion comes over and says, hey, I see that you're upset. Do you want to talk about it? What happens to her physiology in a split second? Whew. The stress levels abate. The body changes in a minute. The heart rate goes down. She takes a deeper breath, gets more oxygen. The cortisol levels go down. But the woman who's stressed and isolated remains under siege by her stress hormones for a long time, including the suppression of the immune system. No wonder then that the women who are isolated and stressed are more likely to have malignant transformation in that lump, which is to say that cancer is not the disease of the individual. Cancer in a person reflects a whole set of psychological and social relationships throughout the lifetime. It's only the end point of something that's been going on for a long, long time. And as somebody very astutely said, trying to, un and, and this is why we're not finding the cure for cancer, because we're not looking where we need to. And as somebody very astutely said, uh, a British researcher, he said that, uh, thanks, he said that trying to find the cause of cancer by studying the individual cell is like trying to understand the traffic jam by studying the internal combustion engine. <clears throat> now, one, one more example. One more example, at the end of life, we know that couples have been together for a long time, one of them is hospitalized, the other one has a significant risk of dying. And a British study just three weeks ago showed that when um, in, an elderly person is bereaved, their partner dies, you can find measurable deleterious changes in the hormonal apparatus and immune systems. In other words, the immune system, the nervous system, the cardiovascular system of the one is modulated by the psychological relationship. So, in understanding illness then, we have to look at this mind-body unity and we have to look at the relationship of that individual to their psychological social environment. So, in, um, in my years of family practice, and then for seven years, I was medical coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital, which is to say, we looked after terminally ill people. <clears throat> I found that who got sick and who didn't was at all, not at all accidental. That, that there were certain patterns that I inevitably I had to be aware of. And all the people that got sick with chronic illness, whether that be, again, cancer, autoimmune disease, neurological disorders like ALS, MS, Parkinson's, and so on. What these patterns were, and I'm telling you, which may sound dogmatic, but I've been at the game long enough to be convinced of this, that there are no exceptions. I'm going to read you some newspaper clippings that illustrate who is illness prone, and I'll, then I'll tell you why. The first is an article. These are all articles from the Globe and Mail newspaper, which is Canada's national paper, and I wrote a medical column for them for a couple of years. <clears throat> It's by a woman. The first article is by a woman who was diagnosed with breast cancer. Her name is Donna. Her doctor's name is Harold, and her husband is called Hi. And Hi's first wife died of breast cancer, and now Donna, the second wife, is diagnosed with the same condition. And Donna writes in his first-person account of her visit to the doctor's office. Harold tells me that the lump is small, and most assuredly not in my lymph nodes, unlike that of Hai's first wife, whose cancer had spread everywhere by the time they found it. You're not going to die, he reassures me. But I'm worried about Hai, I say. I won't have the strength to support him. Now, what do you notice? She's the one diagnosed with a potentially fatal illness. We'll have to go through chemo, radiation, possibly surgery. And her first thought is, how will I support my husband emotionally? So this automatic and compulsive regard for the emotional needs of others while ignoring your own is a major risk factor for disease. Major risk factor. 
The others that I will read you are actually obituaries from the same newspaper, and obituaries are fascinating because they tell us not just about the person who died, but also about what we value in one another unwittingly. And what we value in one another is exactly what kills us. You've heard the, ex you've heard the expression, the good die young. Half of you are breathing easily right now, and you're not worried. <laughs> so this obituary is uh, about a physician died at age 55 of cancer. Never for a day did he contemplate giving up the work he so loved at Toronto Sick Children's Hospital. He carried on, his, he carried on with his duties throughout his year-long battle with cancer, stopping only a few days before he died. So what would you say to a friend of yours diagnosed with cancer? Go back to work tomorrow, and all the while that you're getting treatment, ignore that, ignore your needs, don't think at all about your life, and just keep working until you drop. So this automatic and rigid identification with duty, role, and responsibility, rather than the needs of the self, is the second major risk factor for chronic illness. The next one is written by a husband who is writing this with gratitude about his wife who died age 55 of breast cancer. In her entire life, she never got into a fight with anyone. The worst she could say was fooey or something else along those lines. She had no ego. She just blended in with the environment in an unassuming manner. And I'm sure that, like me, many of you have partners, spouses, sometimes you wish that they would blend in with the environment. <laughs> in an unassuming manner. <laughs> but they won't do that if they want to stay healthy. Because the suppression of the so-called negative emotions, particularly anger, actually suppresses the immune system. And finally, this obituary, which is almost beyond belief, but it's real. This is a physician who died age 72 of cancer. Sidney and his mother had an incredibly special relationship a bond that was apparent in all aspects of their lives until her death. As a married man with young children, Sidney made a point to have dinner with his parents every day as his wife, Rosalind, and their four young kids waited for him at home. Never wanting to disappoint either woman in his life, Sidney would walk in, greeted by yet another dinner to eat and to enjoy, until gradual weight came and began to raise suspicions. This man suffered from two fatal beliefs. One is that he's responsible for how other people feel. And secondly, that he must never disappoint anybody. So there's four, these four factors, this automatic concern for the emotional needs of others, ignoring your own, compulsive and rigid identification with duty, role, and responsibility, rather than the authentic self, um, suppression of so-called negative emotions, repression of them, and finally, the belief that you're responsible for how other people feel and that you must never, dis never disappoint anybody, so you never say no. These are the significant risk factors that are present in cases of chronic illness, and they're quite capable of killing you, for reasons I'll explain shortly. But before I do, let's explain why people behave in these ways. Are we blaming the patient for the disease? We're not blaming the patient for the disease because these are not deliberate, consciously chosen patterns. Remember that Harvard article I quoted to you? Adaptations that help you survive the immediate uh, stress in childhood become source of pathology later on. These are all adaptations. Nobody chooses to believe, behave in these ways. And I can give you a personal example. So I, I'm, when I was 54 or so, I had uh, arthroscopic surgery on one of my knees. I had a bit of a tear in a cartilage. So that afternoon, I had a bit of a limp. And I'm visiting my mother, who there's a genetic disease in our family called muscular dystrophy, which means that if you have the gene, you'll have the disease. But by the way, most diseases are not like that, and there are very few diseases genetically determined. Uh, even in the case of breast cancer, uh, there is a breast cancer gene, or, or several breast cancer genes, but out of 100 women with breast cancer, only seven will have the gene. The gene is not the major cause of breast cancer. Muscular dystrophy, yes, if you have the gene, rare, but you're likely to have the disease. So my mother had it, so at age 78, she could no longer get out of bed, she could barely feed herself. Mentally, she was very strong. So I'm visiting her, and I'm, as I'm walking down the hall of the nursing um, home, I have a bit of a length because of my surgery that morning. 
When I walk into my mother's room, my limp disappears. I greet her with a perfectly normal gait, and I walk out the same way until I shut the door behind me, and again I start limping. Now, what am I doing? I'm protecting her from no knowledge of my pain, but here's the deal. My mother, being 78, has survived the Nazi genocide in Hungary, the communist dictatorship, the Hungarian Revolution in 56, emigration to Canada at the age of 39 with a husband nearly 10 years older, and um, two adolescent boys life in a new culture and a new language, she was a very strong person. Did she need to be protected from the fact that her middle-aged son had a bit of a limp? <laughs> the afternoon of surgery. <laughs> However, remember that quote from Amos, that the child feels the suffering of the, uh, and, and pain of the mother. So I was born in January 44 in Budapest uh, to Jewish parents. When I was two, two months old, the Germans occupied Hungary. And you can imagine what the rest of our year was like. And I learned very early that my mother was so stressed that if I wanted to maintain the attachment relationship with her, I better suppress my own pain because she was already overburdened. So that was an adaptation. And that adaptation still shows up in my automatic suppression of my limp 53 years later. This is what Robin Williams, who died at his own hands, after a life of addiction, mental illness, and um, workaholism called the please love me syndrome. Anything, I'll do anything but love me. See, the child has no choice. The child is in a situation where attachment, and attachment in this case is not in a Buddhist sense, but this is a modern psychological sense. Attachment is the drive for closeness and proximity with another human being for the purpose of being taken care of or of taking care of someone else. So there's this powerful attachment drive between all mammals and their children and their offspring, even birds and their offspring. That attachment drive keeps the infant close to the parent, the parent close to the infant, so the infant can be taken care of. And that attachment drive is um, important to us all our lives, as that example of those elderly couples indicates. In other words, that's the most important dynamic in human life, and our brains are largely wired for attachment, without which we don't survive, because the human infant is the least mature, most dependent, and most helpless of any creature in the universe, and stays that way for the longest period of time. So without attachment, there's no life. This attachment drive, as I'll be telling you later in my talk on addiction this afternoon, is the source of, um, when the attachment needs are not met, this is the source of all pathology, whether physical or mental. And how does it become a source of physical pathology? Well, because we have another need. If we have the need for attachment, you, that's clear. But we have another need, and that is need for authenticity. Authenticity is a sense of being ourselves, and knowing who we are and what we feel. Now, that's not a, a new age, abstract, psychological, spiritual, uh, woo-hoo need. It's actually a survival need. Because to be authentic is to be in touch with your body and your gut feelings. And in the long period of evolutionary development, living in a state of nature amidst all kinds of nature, uh, dangers, how long exactly would a human being survive if they were not in touch with their gut feelings? They wouldn't. So that the, the, the authenticity is as, as, as powerful as the attachment need in the long term. But what happens to a child where the authenticity threatens attachment? And what do I mean by that? Let's say that uh, as a one and a half year old, two year old, um, your child is angry at you. And by the way, if you have a one and a half and two year old and they're never angry with you, you're not doing your job. Because they can't have five cookies before dinner. And they can't climb on the table to play with a shiny knife. So they're gonna get frustrated. So they're gonna throw a tantrum, which is what they do. But how if, what about if you grow up in a home where there was a rageaholic father and the very hint of anger threatens you unconsciously. So you give the message to the child that good little kids don't get angry. In other words, good little, little kids who get angry are not good, they're not acceptable to the parent. Well, guess what? If that message is driven home powerfully enough, the child would repress the anger in order to maintain the attachment relationship. Pure adaptation. But in the long term, that repression of the authentic self as in the cases I mentioned, is what leads to disease. So this is the please love me syndrome. Love me at any cost. The child, when it comes to attachment versus authenticity, has absolutely no choice in the matter. Because without attachment, they can't survive.
Treat me like a fool, treat me mean and cool, but love me. That's not love. Just let me stay attached to you at any cost. Now the problem is that once you make the choice, although it's no choice at all, to go for attachment, then we spend the rest of our lives living that out. And we spend the rest of our lives suppressing our authenticity. Now, how does that lead to illness? Well, it leads to illness for the very simple reason as you can't separate the mind from the body. And we now know scientifically that there's no basis for those separations. So it's not that there's a nervous system and an immune system and a hormonal apparatus and a cardiovascular system and an emotional system. It's all part and parcel of the same system. There's a science that's I would say it's new, but it's only relatively new. It's been around for a few decades now. It's called psychoneuro psychoneuroimmunology that studies the connections and the unity of the emotional system, the immune system, the hormonal apparatus, and the nervous system. It turns out there aren't separate systems, it's just one. To say that they're even connected is, is kind of false because you, you connect two things that are discrete, but these are not discrete systems. They're just the differentiated functioning of the same super system. So it turns out that the nervous system wires them all together like a giant electrical grid. It connects the bone marrow to the brain. It sends messages from the bone marrow to the brain, from the brain to the bone marrow, where our immune and red cells are manufactured, from the thymus gland in the neck, where the white cells are stored, to the brain and vice versa, the gut to the brain, the heart to the brain, brain to the heart. The heart itself is a nervous system. It's like a second brain in a sense. It has certain predictive capacities, especially for negative things. We say, I knew in my heart, you did. And that's connected to the brain up here. Then they all secrete messenger substances into the circulation and they talk to one another biochemically so that the, um, the immune cells, the white cells in your circulation have um, the capacity to manufacture every hormone that the brain manufactures. And so the immune system is talking to the brain, and the brain is talking to the immune system. The immune system has been called the floating brain. It's got learning capacity, reactive capacity, and memory, just like the brain does. Then there's the gut-brain connection. I'm going to ask you this question and ask for a show of hands, please. If you've had the following experience, please put your hand up. That You've had a powerful gut feeling about something, you ignored it, and you were sorry afterwards. Okay. Now, let me ask for the obverse. Those of you that have a powerful gut feeling, you ignored it, and you're grateful afterwards, put your hand up. Now, you see how much more the, the majority has it is with the gut. Now, I would even argue, had I had time, with those of you that just put your hand up, that what you had was not a gut feeling at all. It was just a strong emotion. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference. But there's a difference. You know, the gut feeling um, is there's something calm and knowing about it. There's no agitation about it. But nevertheless, even if I take your word for it, it's still like, you know, 30 to 1. So why is the gut so much more intelligent than your thoughts? In other words, when you went with your thoughts, you were wrong. If you pay attention to your gut feelings, you were right. Well, the gut sends many more messages to the brain than come the other way. If you've ever been treated for depression, like I have with, say, Prozac, which elevates serotonin levels, the gut has more serotonin than the brain does, the mood chemical. The gut receives messages from the whole brain, and it magnifies them and sends them back up, so that when you are listening to gut feelings, you're getting the whole picture. Your intellect, your thoughts, are only a very small part of your... Uh, of your um, evaluative apparatus and emotions came much before we had thoughts necessarily because without strong gut feelings again we just didn't survive now there's a group of people called aphasiacs who can't process words because they had a stroke in that part of the brain aphasiacs have been shown in a number of studies to be much more astute at knowing when somebody's a liar than people who understand language. Why do you suppose that is? 
because they take in the whole picture, the body language, the tone of voice, the facial expression, the congruence of body language, tone, and facial expression. And that's a much more significant markers of truth than the words are. If, if, if aphasiacs voted, no politician would ever get elected. <laughs> but there's another large group of people, but there's another large group of people who, I mean, if you look, uh, you know, I, and, and that may seem like sort of a, a knock on politicians, but let me tell you, um, there was a very interesting phenomenon with, with President George, George Bush Jr. If you ever, I don't know if you ever had this experience, but if you ever turned off the sound on the television and he was speaking, what would you observe? A very nervous and scared little kid. And this guy was the most powerful man in the world, so they say. A scared little kid. Now, there's another large group of human beings who are perfectly capable of unerringly reading and reacting to their gut feelings. And what do we call those people? What do we call them? Children. Children. We call them babies. Okay, no one day old baby is disconnected from the gut feelings. When you put your hand up and I ask you, how many of you had the experience of ignoring and then regretting, not having paid attention to gut feelings, you were telling me the story of your childhood. The story of your childhood was that when you, you were born pristine and authentic, completely in touch with yourself, and then you learned that in order to stay attached to your environment, you had to suppress that part of yourself. So the, so the, so the suppression itself became associated with survival. No wonder you're afraid to be authentic. Because there's something in you that says, if I'm authentic, I won't be loved anymore, and if I'm not loved, I won't survive. Then we keep choosing attachment over authenticity, and then we get sick. And then we get sick. Let me give you an example. Um, I just need um, a volunteer, okay? So I mentioned that the suppression of anger suppresses the immune system, so you're going to volunteer. Thanks. No, you need to stay where you are. What's your name? Judith, okay. So uh, there's one, one rule here, only Judith, okay? Which is that the chair that you're sitting in is your life, so you can't leave it, okay? For this experiment. After the talk, you can leave, or, you, or, even, or even before the talk, but not for this experiment, okay? So the question I'm going to ask you is, are you okay with the distance between you and I right now? If I spoke from here for the rest of the morning, is that okay with you? Okay, now, I'm going to stand here and ask you the same question. Is it still okay with you? If I lecture from here, how about right now? Yeah. Is it still okay, okay with you? Okay, what about right now? It's getting a little tight. <laughs> it's getting a little tight? Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's still okay. It's still okay. All right, I'm going to put a knee on your knee. No, uh, <laughs> how's that now? It feels good. It feels good. I'm going to stand on your knee in a minute. No, you're not. You, no, you're not. Okay, how would, how would that feel to you? I wouldn't like you it. You wouldn't like it. What would you do about it? Okay, right. And as you're pushing, what emotion do you think you'd be generating? Fear and anger. Anger. The fear would come first. Yeah. And then the anger. Yeah. So in other words, the anger is not a negative emotion. It's a healthy boundary defense. Anger, healthy anger simply says, you're in my space, get out. That's healthy anger. There's unhealthy anger, but that's different. Healthy anger says, you're in my space, get out. Healthy anger is in the present. It's not about the past and the future. It's just, it's a boundary defense, you're in my space, get out. That's it. Now, if you look at the role of emotions in general, what is their job? Now, in another situation with another person, you actually might invite them closer. Perhaps. You know, some people in your life, in some situations, you would invite closer. So the role of emotions is to tell you what you want more of and being closer to you, allow in to your space, and to keep out the unwelcome and the potentially dangerous. That's all the emotion. Invite in the nourishing, the healthy, the welcome, keep out the dangerous, threatening, unwelcome. What is the role of the immune system? It's exactly the same thing. The immune system and the emotional system do exactly the same thing. Because of the unity that I've mentioned to you, when you suppress the one, you're suppressing the other. And that's why the repression of healthy anger is a significant risk factor for, for cancer, because the immune system is suppressed. Now, on the other hand, what else can happen? If, let's say you repress anger. You're one of these really nice people, and you're always helping people. You never say no. And the book of mine that this talk is based on is entitled, When the Body Says No. My contention being is if you don't, the body will say it for you. I may have said that before. 
So what happens to anger that you don't express? Does it evaporate, go away, fly to the moon? Where does it turn? It turns against you in a form of depression. What does the word depression mean? It means to push something down. It's that simple. It was an adaptation. Depression begins as an adaptation. You have to push down your feelings to stay attached. 30 years later, you're taking Prozac. And they tell you, you got this genetic disease. Nonsense. In the same way that the anger can turn against you in the form of depression or self-loathing, self-blame, in the same way, the immune system can turn against you so that your immune cells and um, immune organs that are meant to <clears throat> defend you will not attack you. And that's autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, Crohn's, colitis, fibromyalgia, and multiple sclerosis. So, I'm going to bring this to a close, and I'm sorry I will not have time for questions, but I'm happy to hang on afterwards um, and talk to people. I'm going to close with a quote from my honored teacher, Alma, sorry, Hamid Ali, who says, the fundamental thing that happened and the greatest calamity is not that there was no love or support. He's talking about childhood. The greater calamity, which was caused by that first calamity, is that you lost the connection to your essence. That is much more important than whether your mother or father loved you or not. Well, that's the good news. Because if the problem was that you were not loved, supported, recognized, honored, or if you were abused 15, 30, 50 years ago, if that was the problem, we're stuck because we can't undo the past. But if the problem was that as a result of those events, we disconnected from ourselves in order to maintain, stay attached, our cells, our essence is still here and we can reconnect. We can reconnect, so that's the good news. And in that sense, although we tend to look upon symptoms and illness as enemies to get rid of, we talk about the war on cancer, the battle against cancer, we can look up at it totally differently. Yeah, receive what medical treatment makes sense to you. I'm, not, I'm a physician, I'm not against medical treatment or medical advancement, but also ask the question, what is my body saying no to that I didn't say no to? What is the meaning of this relapse of my rheumatoid arthritis? What stresses did I impose on myself? Where didn't I say no? And then the illness can actually become your teacher. Your teacher towards what? Towards authenticity. And let me ask you this final question. How many of you know people who have recovered from addiction or some serious illness, and some people even who don't recover from a serious illness, but will still say, and I've heard this many times, I'll still say, that addiction, that illness was the best thing that ever happened to me. How many of you heard such statements? Many of you have. I certainly have in my uh, career as a physician. What are people talking about? They're talking about that the illness forced me to become authentic. It gave me back myself, which is what Almas calls the precious pearl. Thanks very much.